Hello, thanks everybody for coming. My name is Ben Westhoff. I am the author of Fentanyl Inc. I started writing the book a few years after a very close friend died from fentanyl. His name was Michael Schaefermeyer. He was an amazing DJ and we were very close. He used the fentanyl patches that were obtained illegally and uh, put them in all parts of his body. Um, when the fentanyl epidemic really began in earnest a few years later, it was mostly coming from illicit fentanyl. And I knew very little about fentanyl at the time. And so I started researching to learn everything I could. I learned that it was invented by a Belgian chemist named Paul Janssen in 1959 as an alternative to morphine. And it was kind of a revelation in the operating theater. It came on more quickly than morphine. It caused less nausea. And it came off more quickly too, meaning that patients didn't have to be laid up for so long. Fentanyl stayed in the medical realm for decades and decades until it finally jumped into the recreational realm uh, starting about 10 years ago. Last year, it, in, uh, excuse me, 2021, it killed, it says 107,000 people on this slide, but the number has been actually updated to about 110,000 110, people. What makes fentanyl such a potent drug of abuse and so desirable for drug dealers? Well, heroin comes from a natural plant, the opium poppy, and it's very expensive to produce. You need fields, you need to water it, it's very susceptible to law enforcement, whereas fentanyl is just made in a lab. It's 50 times stronger than heroin, and it's much, much cheaper. So I wanted to learn about where fentanyl came from. I kept hearing that it was made in labs in China. And so, but yet nobody had done any reporting on it basically at all. So I started just by Googling, buy fentanyl in China. And all these websites came up for chemical companies that were selling fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, which are just slight variations of the fentanyl molecule that are manipulated so that they're legal. So China banned fentanyl a number of years ago, but these analogs, all these companies had to do is just subtly manipulate the molecule, and bam, now they had something legal. These companies were also selling fentanyl precursors, which are the most important ingredients needed to make fentanyl. Once you have a fentanyl precursor, you're about 90% of the way. So the next thing I did was I made a fake drug dealer alter ego. <laughs> and if you look up in the left-hand corner, you'll see the name I chose for this fake alter ego, which was Johnny Webster for some reason. And I also chose an avatar that I imagined a drug trafficker might have. Uh, and so I began communicating with these drug dealers, with these uh, salespeople from these chemical companies and these lab owners in China. And these companies operated in what you would call the gray market, meaning they were selling chemicals that were legal in China, but illegal in the US. And so this included the fentanyl products I was talking about and also anabolic steroids. So if you see the names of these uh, people I was communicating with on Skype, you can see they have these funny names like K-Roid is one of them. And then below that, a guy who calls himself Sean Steroid Hormone. <laughs> so not a lot of subtlety here. Uh, I developed a rapport with these salespeople and these lab owners and I said, if I were to come to China, could I visit your lab? Some of them said yes and so I got on a plane to China. I was in Shanghai, I met up with this man uh, on the right. His name is Dawson Lee. This is actually his LinkedIn profile picture. And uh, he ran a lab outside of Shanghai that was devoted to fentanyl analogs and synthetic cannabinoids, 
also known as K2 and spice. These are types of synthetic marijuana, they're sometimes called. So we met at a train station, and then Dawson Lee took me back to his home, apart, his, uh, home office and vetted me, he had lots and lots of questions for me, including point blank, are you a journalist? And so I had to uh, you know, look him in the eye and say, that's crazy. <laughs> why, why, why would you think such a thing? Uh, eventually, he decided I passed muster, and so took me to his lab. It was in, it, it, I was shocked when we saw it. It was basically looked like a suburban office park with a big water fountain out front. I expected guys holding AK-47s to be guarding the door, but it wasn't like that. Um, inside, it was pretty much like a, the Breaking Bad lab, or, or you know, if you took high school chemistry class, it was glassware, beakers, funnels. Um, they had these big machines for drying the chemicals that looked almost exactly like the, if you go to Subway, those, those machines for baking the bread, look just like that. Um, and the sheer volume of chemicals they were making just blew me away. Uh, in the movie Scarface, you remember at the end, Tony Montana with the powder on his lapels, sitting at the desk with the giant mounds of cocaine. Well, that, you know, that was child's play, really, compared to this. And it was a small lab with only five people, yet they were making enough drugs to get small countries high. Um, I go into more detail about this in my book, um, but my next stop was in Wuhan. So this was 2018, this was pre-coronavirus. All I really knew about Wuhan was that they call it the Chicago of China. It's a, it's a big industrial city in the middle of the country that has a very important pharmaceutical and chemical manufacturing sector. Um, there I was hoping to meet a guy whose company made more fentanyl precursors than any other company in the world. It wasn't actually very hard to do at all because they published their address right on the internet. <laughs> and so I just showed up. Well, I wasn't sure I had the right address when I got there because it, it was this hotel. Uh, but it turns out that some floors of the hotel were dedicated to paying hotel guests and others were dedicated to this chemical company. Um, I was supposed to meet up with Sean's steroid hormone, <laughs> but it turns out he actually worked at a different branch. And so when I arrived, I met up with the, the two saleswomen to my right in this photo. Um, the first one introduced herself as Amy, and she said she could help me along with her colleague, also pictured, who's also named Amy. And um, to their right is the CEO of the company, whose name is Yeshuan Fa. And I ended up talking to him later, admitting I was a journalist once I had returned to the US. And he claimed that his company doesn't actually know what these people, you know, their customers use these fentanyl precursors for. He called them chemical intermediaries and said that, you know, there are all sorts of uses. People could use these for anything. Although I talked to chemical experts who said that, no, the only thing people use these chemicals for is making fentanyl. And their number one customer, it turns out, is the Mexican cartels. So I got the full tour, and I was really shocked to see at this company, this Wuhan company, it's called Yuan Chung. Um, hundreds and hundreds of employees sitting at cubicles in front of desktop computers. They were chosen largely for their English abilities, and it looked just like a Western office, really, except that they were selling ingredients for the world's deadliest drug. They showed me the fake packaging that they used to smuggle the drugs uh, overseas, and they got this one that's uh, bread, flour. This other one is uh, fake dog food packaging. And they said, you know, on the rare chance that Customs actually did seize these chemicals, they would just give me a full refund. Uh, even got to 
see the company chef and uh, he was preparing their meals. People lived in the, the employees lived in the hotel. They got free room and board for working there. And uh, it was a desirable job for a recent college graduate. Saw this sign when I left, it seemed very ironic. Chemicals create a better life. Uh, so after I got home, my book came out and it raised a lot of connections between this company and the Chinese government. It turned out that the Chinese government was actually subsidizing the illicit production, uh, excuse me, the, the gray market production of these fentanyl precursors. They were giving tax rebates for their, uh, for, for sending them overseas. And um, they even gave research and development grants to this company. Then in December 2021, the U.S. Department of Justice announced the indict, un unsealed the indictment of this CEO who I met with, Ye Xuan Fa, and also announced that there would be a $5 million reward leading to information leading to his capture. Um, he's still at large and most likely will not be arrested since he knows about the indictment. Um, you know, he's not going to leave the country China has no extradition treaty with the US, and so as long as he stays in China, or at least away from our, the countries we're allied with, um, he probably will not be arrested at all. Another thing that happened after I left China was that the country had issued a blanket ban of all fentanyl analogs. So no longer could these chemists just subtly manipulate the chemicals to get a new legal version of fentanyl. So a lot of people thought this was great news. You know, the US government was very excited about it. And indeed, seizures of fentanyl analogs in the US dropped precipitously. Unfortunately, there were unintended side effects. One was the rise of a new drug called ISO. And all of a sudden, we started seeing people dying from ISO all over the country. Um, recently, you've probably heard about things like Trank Dope, Xylazine, all of these different new chemicals that no one had heard of until recently. And it turns out the reason these are popular is because simply they're not fentanyls. They're not fentanyl analogs. And so technically, they're legal to make in China. And so it's a constant cat and mouse game. Whenever something is banned there, the, these chemists shift to something else. It's crazy, these are drug traffickers who really care about following the law. <laughs> it's, it's a very strange phenomenon. So the fentanyl precursors are still legal in China and they are sent across the ocean to Mexico where the Mexican cartels um, they make it into finished fentanyl, they cut it, they cut fentanyl into cocaine, meth, uh, heroin, and in particular prescription pills are becoming increasingly common. They look, they look just like regular pills like a Xanax or an Adderall, uh, Oxycontin, something like that, except that they don't have the original pharmaceutical drug, they have fentanyl. Now there's been a new evolution in that the cartels have started releasing these pills known as Skittles or, or rainbow pills. And what's different about these pills is that nobody would look at these and say, that's a legitimate pharmaceutical product, right? They're, they're no longer trying to fool anyone. In fact, we're recently witnessing a disturbing new evolution in the fentanyl crisis. Which is, the, which is that users are starting to ask for fentanyl by name. So it's no longer just adulterating other drugs. Um, you can see this in particular in places like San Francisco, where some of the biggest tourist areas have become open air drug markets. And people are on the street selling fentanyl by name. It's still cut into heroin. You're not gonna find any pure heroin, you know, 
mixed with meth, a lot of benzos, fake Xanax, cut with fentanyl. Um, and it's coming west in a big way. This is a chart from just a few years ago showing that fentanyl deaths were largely concentrated on the East Coast and the Midwest. But now if you see today, it's, it's come to the, the West in a big way. Uh, so the biggest thing I learned from my trip to China was basically that we can't stop drugs from getting into this country. I spoke with a border agent here in San Diego who said that, who estimates we get less than 1% of the drugs coming into this country. So to me, all we can really do is focus on helping our own people. And so I think one thing that's extremely important is a widespread education campaign. This, this news story I found a little disturbing that only 50% of Arizona eighth graders had even heard of fentanyl. Um, I think we need a federally run education campaign, you know, not something like DARE, not scaremongering, but something that sticks with the facts because the facts really are plenty sobering enough. Of course, uh, promoting harm reduction measures like um, the widespread distribution of Narcan. Um, and after I'm talking right now, I believe there's a demonstration happening. There's about the most Narcan I've ever seen in my life uh, out in the lobby right now. So, so I think we're, do, we're doing our part when it comes to that one. Um, but particularly important is medication-assisted treatment. Um, only uh, something like 85% of people with substance use disorder, excuse me, opioid use disorder specifically, don't receive any form of medication-assisted treatment. You know, we're lucky that there are three medications approved by the FDA for, uh, to, to, bite, to fight opioid use disorder. And um, you have uh, methadone, buprenorphine, best known as Suboxone, and Naltrexone, which is best known as the Vivitrol shot. Um, hear a lot in the media about the agonists, which are methadone and Suboxone. Um, but the, the downside to, to, to some people is that these are actually addicting drugs in themselves. I think that Vivitrol um, needs to be a bigger part of the conversation. Uh, Vivitrol is completely non-addicting, and um, it's, it's not for everyone. Uh, you have to be completely detoxed to take Vivitrol, and that's very tall order for a lot of patients, but particularly for people who are coming out of prison uh, and thus have no opioids in their system, um, as well as highly motivated uh, users like doctors and pilots, for example, um, can, can take Vivitrol and go back to work. So I'm actually currently working on a documentary about naltrexone, and um, I'm going to have my slide uh, with my contact information at the end if anyone would like to um, find out more information about that. Uh, so in conclusion, we, we've got this awful crisis doesn't seem to be getting any better. Uh, but at the same time, I believe that if we use common sense solutions, we really can push back. We already have the tools that we need. Um, this isn't like during COVID where we were searching desperately for a vaccine. We have the medications. We just have to help them get into the right hands of the right people. So thank you everyone for listening.